I believe we are going. Hey guys, welcome to another Ultimate Edge webinar series. We're back with Tom Howell, who has a company called Tax Street, and a couple other companies Tom has, which you might tell us about. Tom is a frequent visitor to our channel. And thanks for joining us again, Tom. I know we can't see you, but I think we can hear you and we can see your slides. Are you there? I am here. Welcome. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. Tom and I were having a chat some time back. Uh, we were at another real estate conference. There was all kinds of questions coming up in regards to taxes. I said, we should hit this one again, Tom. There's all kinds of questions around it. So we're back. Um, Tom is a, an enrolled agent, which from my perspective is probably more helpful than a CPA because an enrolled agent has been trained by the IRS about taxes. I will tell you, he's one of the best tax strategy guys I know, which is why I keep inviting him back. And that's what we're going to talk about today is tax strategies to help build and maintain wealth. It's not what you make, but what you keep that counts. So, Tom, with that, let's go ahead and talk about taxes, please. OK, thank you. Uh, the uh, Yeah, you took all my thunder off my slide. I like that. That's good. I, will, <laughs> I like your slide. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, now my slides aren't advancing. Can you see that now? Yep. I see Albert. You see Albert Einstein? Yes, we do. So I like to start with a couple of, of humorous comments about taxes. Albert Einstein, who we know is one of the smartest people we've ever heard of, said the hardest thing in the world to understand is the income tax. So if anyone gets confused, don't feel bad about it. And Mark Twain said the only difference between a tax man and a taxidermist is that the taxidermist leaves the skin. So. <laughs> The IRS has quite the reputation. I like Mark's com Mark Twain's um, comment better than Albert's. I think it's pretty clever. I do. It's pretty clever. Yeah, it is. So one of the things that we really need to have in order to beat the IRS at their own game is some tax planning. The rules are out there. We can do a lot of different things. Um, Judge Learned Hand told us that there's nothing wrong with with configuring our affairs in such a way as to keep taxes as low as legally possible. So there is no duty to pay more taxes than are due. And tax planning is developing that strategy that ensures financial defense and guarantees the financial results that you want. So as we build wealth, one of the things we want to talk about is what we call the break-even formula. This is not talked about often enough. So the break-even rate is simply the return on your net worth that you need to have in order to beat the, the, the rate of inflation. So our wealth needs to go up faster than the cost of our products and, and the things that we buy. So if we don't make enough money to keep up with the inflation, less the drag of taxes, we end up losing purchasing power over time. So that formula that we works is up there at the top. One example we have is if you have 4% inflation, which we have about now, and a tax rate of 30%, the break-even rate that you need to make on your net worth and equity is 5.71%. So you need to make that much compounded each year just to maintain your purchasing power. That's not gaining wealth. That's just keeping the same wealth. And I'll give you that, a stark, I'm sorry? I just say, to Tom, that is significant, no doubt. It is significant because people think of, you know, 3 or 4% savings is good and safe. The problem is, is you can't buy more groceries in 10 years than you can buy today, even though you're making a little bit of money. And so, but, Tom, to put this in simplistic terms, I suspect you're going to talk about real estate and you're going to talk about investments and, and yields and all of that. But if you're a wage earner, a W-2 wage earner, and you don't get a raise every year, a little over 5.71%, you're losing ground to inflation right there. Is that correct? Correct. If you don't maintain your income at that level, you also are falling behind in your purchasing power over time. Yeah, okay. Sobering thoughts. So here's a, here's a very stark example. If we take $1 and double it every day for 20 days, if we were tax-free without the drag of taxes, we'd have a $1,048,000. However, if we have to pay 30% tax each day on what we made that day, we would only accumulate $40,000 over time. 
So you can see just that 30% drag, how how drastic that is to the wealth building that we have. It is significant. So in the IRS uh, world, we actually have two tax systems. If you think of it this way, employees get paid with their wages. And out of those wages, we deduct all the taxes for Social Security, Medicare, federal income tax, and we get a net paycheck after taxes. But then we have to take that net money and pay for our rent, our phone, travel, meals with the after-tax dollars. However, if we do the business owner system, we earn our business income, and first we deduct auto, phone, rent, travel, meals that are part of our business deductions, and we end up with a net profit. It's only on that net profit that we add in that we then deduct the Social Security, Medicare, and income tax. So for those expenses, those meals, those business miles, those expenses that we're paying to maintain our life, uh, employees don't get to deduct those, but business owners do. So business owners actually benefit by having their business. Good. One of the more common questions I get is always, what do we want to have for our entity for our different businesses? And we have several choices. The sole proprietor is the easiest to set up. You can set up an LLC, limited liability company. You could do an S Corp, a C Corp. But the question on which entity do you need has a lot to do with what are you going to do with it? Are you going to deduct fringe benefits over time? Do you want to fund a retirement plan? And so on. So the the for most people, this is a simple diagram of what I would recommend. You would have a holding LLC in which you put your rental properties, and it could be one LLC or multiple LLCs. And then I also advocate that you set up an S Corp for the management of those rentals so that you can move management fees. Now, we could go pretty aggressive here. We could do 15% of rent. We could do 2% of asset value and move all that money into the management S Corp. And then we also want to add in any income we make from flipping a house, wholesaling a house, making commissions or fees related to real estate. We pour all that income into the S Corp. Then we deduct the things like mileage, cell phone, and ideally we set up a solo 401k. And then we can teach you how to invest with your 401k into real estate. Tom, this is a great slide. Can I pause you for a moment and ask sure. a couple of questions? Yep. And for those of you on the webinar, if you will put your questions into the chat box, I'll monitor those as we go along here and ask Tom as we move forward. I'm happy to do so. Um, LLC. So the holding LLC holds different properties, and I get different answers to this question. So how many properties should you have in one LLC before you create another one? And is there a good strategy there around that that we should be aware of? So some attorneys will tell you to put one property in each LLC. I think that's too much bookkeeping and too hard for people to keep up with. Yeah, I recommend holding so much equity in the LLC. So, and this depends on your scale. Certainly, if you have a million dollars in equity all in one LLC, that whole million dollars is at risk if anything happens inside that LLC. Any tenant in any of those houses falls down, gets hurt, and ha and sues you in excess of your insurance coverage all your equity could be at risk. So I would recommend that you do something like $250,000 or $500,000 of equity in each LLC. Oh, it's As the properties okay. grow in value, you either be financed to pull the money out so you never go over half a million in equity, okay. or you split and move the properties into new LLCs as they grow in value over time. Okay, that, that makes good sense to me. And Tom, I see you have the management S Corporation set up here and you're running management fees through there and you're doing a lot of deductions through there. What's the difference from a tax perspective? Is it advantageous to do this as opposed to just having the LLC and deducting the same expenses within the LLC? You can deduct the mileage and the cell phone. It's hard to set up the solo 401k, okay. which is which is a big deduction. Okay, and then good. What I want to do is I want to turn your management fees into ordinary income, create larger losses on the rentals, and move that income into the S-Corp, and then deduct the expenses. All right. 
Now, I'm going to ask this question, which may get answered later on. So what you're doing, Tom, is you're reducing taxable income. That's the goal here. Um, unfortunately, for our real estate buyers who are self-employed, it also reduces qualifying income for what they can qualify for to purchase more real estate. Um, they can do that, as you know, well, and we'll do another webinar on this. Potentially, we've already got some on the DSCR loan, so they just use the income from the properties. But here's the question. The rate differential on a DSCR loan is probably about 1%, maybe a little more than that, higher than a regular Fannie Mae conventional kind of loan. So if, you, if a borrower is using DSCR loans to purchase property, they're going to pay more interest rate, 1% to 1.5%, maybe 2 but they're going to get lower deduction in taxes. Um, do you have kind of a general answer on does it make more sense to reduce taxes and pay higher interest rate, or where is the dividing line to make a decision there? Well, as you know, I'm a big fan of DSCR loans for investment properties. I do. And, and we do need to measure loan constant rather than interest rate. So I would argue that the interest only payment on a DSCR loan, even at higher interest, the payment would be lower than an amortized payment on a conventional loan. Correct. And what we you can always amortize and pay off an interest only loan, just kick in 500 bucks a month to the on the payment and you'll be amortizing the loan if you want. But if you end up with a long-term vacancy or some other gap in income, you want the lowest possible payment for safety. So okay. the safest debt is that debt that has the lowest payment for the same amount of debt. And the DSCR loan will do that in most cases. It, I ag agreed with that. Okay, so for safety, use the DSCR loan just because you get a lower payment potential. Is there any way to measure the tax consequences of one over the other? A higher interest rate on your rental properties versus lower taxes on the management fee income? So the the higher interest actually saves us taxes because for the same right. payment, we're getting bigger tax deductions because we're putting more interest on your Schedule E. We're still moving income into the S-Corp so we can deduct uh, other expenses and best case in my world is funding a 401k and matching it with the business profit. Okay. Very and good. I don't know, do you, do you add back 401k contributions back to income? Um, I, that's a good question. I think it depends on the type of loan, but I'll have to research that to give a solid answer on so that. On, when, so on a wage earner, do you take their gross income or do you take yes. their net after We 401k? use gross income for the wage earner. So you should use for you should use gross income with you know subtract the depreciation and the four hundred one k or add uh, it well back. We certainly, and, yeah, and we then, we certainly subtract depreciation. I just haven't seen enough borrowers with four hundred one k contributions to know that for sure. But I'll I'll double check. Right. Good point. So more people need to do the solo four hundred one k and use that for their real estate investing because that's how we get the 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 no tax drag. So that our instead of making forty thousand, we make a million. Right. Good. Okay. Well, I paused you long enough on this slide, Tom. Thanks for those answers. Okay. So here's the what most people go through. They form the LLC. We then elect an S status filing with the IRS. Hire ourselves on our payroll. Deduct the fringe benefits like the four hundred one k medical things like that. And here we fund that that 401k, including 25% of the profit of the business can go in there as a match. So we can not only deduct money from our payroll, we the company also can put in a significant amount of money. So it's possible to get as much as $68,000 into a 401k each year per person. Wow. So then we talk about business deductions. And there is no real magic list of what the IRS says you can and can't deduct. They do have a couple of rules. It must be ordinary and necessary for the production of income. It must be paid during the current year, and paid can mean charged on a credit card. You don't have to pay the credit card to be able to deduct your expenses. And it has to be reasonable. I call that the red face test. So there are some expenses. So if you are, uh, you know, a model or an actress, some forms of a plastic surgery may be a business deduction, but it's not for the rest of us. <laughs> and certain professions, musicians can go through and have their dental work done if it affects the way that they, you know, play their saxophone. 
So there's a lot of different expenses the IRS has allowed for different professions. These are some of the common deductions. Everybody, I think, has probably heard of these. But these are ordinary and necessary for the production of income. So uh, we want to make sure we, we identify and subtract all those expenses from our income. So we then pay the lowest possible tax. One of the things that's big on our list is automobiles. So here the AAA shows us how much it costs to operate a particular type of vehicle. In 2023, the IRS gave us 65 and a half cents a mile if we just took the mileage method. However, if we did actual expenses, AAA says that even if you had a medium sedan, it would have been 73 cents. If you drive a pickup truck, it'd be 81 cents. And even the electric vehicle would be 67 cents a mile, more than the IRS gives us. So it's pretty simple to just keep an envelope next to your seat or in your glove box and, and stuff all your receipts in there all year. And then take an hour at the end of the year and, and put it all together and see what your total is. And for most people, the actual expenses will be better. And it could be $1,000 to $3,000 of additional deduction. At 30%, that's $600, $800, $900 more savings in tax for an hour or two of work. Oh, that's significant. So, Tom, it's as easy as taking the envelope and keeping track of your gas receipts. And from those, you can compute the mileage, or do you also need to keep track of the mileage? No, no matter what method you use, you have to keep a mileage log. Okay. So, the mileage log is required either way. Um, most people do not do that good on a mileage log, but there are applications out there like Mile IQ that you can put on your phone. And every time you start your car, it'll ask you, is this a business mile or is this a personal mile? And, and it'll give you these beautiful reports at the end of the month or end of the year. Cool. Well, that, that's worth the price of admission for this <laughs> webinar alone, not having that out. So, yeah. A another strategy that we don't hear a lot about is to hire your kids. So the IRS says that children seven and above can be paid to do tasks, simple tasks. They can put stamps on postcards. They can help you with your mailings. They could wash your car before your business meetings. They could help you clean your rentals. Any of that, you can pay them a wage. The first 14,000 that you pay them is tax-free to them. The next 11 is only 10% taxed. So you're deducting you know, 25,000 at 30% and they're only paying 10% on 11,000. So you save, um, seventy five hundred dollars on your taxes, and your child might pay only eleven hundred on theirs. Significant savings. Yeah. You also can contribute to an IRA, which means you can pay your kids even more money and let them put money in their own IRA. They do have to be paid a reasonable wage, so you can pick twenty bucks an hour, some number like that. There should be a written timesheet showing what they did, and you should actually write a payroll check to them and put it in their bank account. So um, this is available to any business that's unincorporated. So it won't work for the S-Corp, but it will work for Schedule C sole proprietors. Even if you have a hobby business on the side, we could deduct your children there. So, Tom, a couple of questions here. It might make sense then if you have an S-Corp or some other entity, an LLC, to have a business with just the Schedule C income so you can do something of this nature. Does that work? That works. All right. And is there, I just might be kind of a funny question, but is there any um, age limit that you can do this with your kids? Like your 25 year old kid who's at home still watching TV from the couch? No judgment you, there. You, you um, can. One of the great benefits of, of children under 18 is you don't have to pay Social Security and Medicare tax on their wages. Okay. As soon as yeah, they turn 18, you can still pay them, but they have to. Uh, pay Social Security and Medicare on their paycheck. And right. if you use, you know, a payroll software, all that's done automatically. I was going to ask you how complicated it is. Is Quicken a good one for that? No. Uh, QuickBooks is actually among the more expensive options. Okay. I like uh, I like Gusto. Most of my clients, we refer to Gusto. And we actually have a coupon available for a discount to get them started. Uh, another one is ADP is popular. ADP is a little more complicated because it's meant for bigger companies, but but Gusto is very simple to use. 
Okay. Great. Great information. Thanks. Another one that we, this used to be popular years ago and it is not so much anymore, but it should be. We call it the medical expense reimbursement plan. This is an independent plan, not tied to a health savings account or an HRA. This is one you do yourself. You do have to have a common law employee. So if you pay your spouse wages from your sole proprietorship or you pay yourself from an, a C-Corp, you can then reimburse yourself and all your employees for their out-of-pocket medical. And there is no limit. You can make that 5000 a year, 10000 20000 So particularly if you have an expensive medical situation, you can make the company pay the medical expenses and deduct them on the on the business. And Tom, does that have to be um, the, what type of company? Can you LLC, S Corp, C Corp, or what? It has quality? to be a C Corp, or you have to pay your spouse through your sole proprietorship. Okay. So Got S Corps it. don't work. Okay. Okay. And then the one that I really like to talk about is the QRP. This includes the 401k or it include what we call a defined contribution plan, which is kind of the granddaddy of, of contribution plans. So for this year, you can contribute up to 23. It's actually uh, 23.5. You can contribute 23,500 out of your paychecks. If you're over 50, the company, you can actually do 30,500 then the company, if it has enough profit, can match $2 for every one you put in, not to exceed 25% of its business income. So you could remove $69,000 from your tax return on the income side, but you still have the money on your 401k. So it's still the same money on your balance sheet. It just moved from one pocket to another in the same pair of pants. Okay. And what That's people don't realize is is you can self-direct your own 401k, oops, and you can buy real estate, lease options, regular options, discounted notes. You can lend on projects. You can do some flip deals and rehab and pay no current taxes and all that income comes back into the 401k ready to go again and again and again. Tom, just to clarify, is there a difference between a solo 401k and a self-directed 401k? A solo 401k is simply a husband and wife company plan. So those Fidelity or Schwab will give you a solo 401k, but they're not self-directed. I like to have people set up their own self-directed 401k, which enable us to do these self-directed choices. Got it. And I host my solo 401k at Fidelity. And if I wanted to, I could invest in anything they'll sell, stocks or bonds. Um, but then I also have the uh, have the option of investing in real estate or loans or anything else. Another magical part of real estate is depreciation. So the IRS says that over time, assets deteriorate in value, that they, they get used up. So on a residential property, the IRS says it's 27 and a half years. So we get to take depreciation over 27 and a half years, which the IRS would assume would get you to zero value. And in fact, it's going up most of the time we see appreciation. So the secret to, to making it all work is to break the property apart into its respective pieces. So the first thing we do is take the land and put it to the side. And from that land, we take whatever improvements we did. So if we built a retaining wall, did gardening, we had to put a driveway in. Um, all of that would be depreciated over 15 years, whereas the raw land itself would be no depreciation allowed. And then on the structure, we break it apart into the, the structure itself, the things that need to be there for the building to stand up, and everything else that's in it is personal property. And we can take that over five or seven years. So when we break the building apart, we call that cost segregation, we're able to front load more of that depreciation and not just wait 27 and a half years to deduct all of it. So here's some example of personal property. So the cabinets, the countertops, the flooring, the appliances, 
a security system, any non-structural walls, window treatments, all of that is broken out from the house and depreciated on a much faster timeline than the building itself. Tom, and can then, I ask a couple of questions around this? Sure. Or, um, sure. Question number one is, what tax situation do, do people have that would really benefit them the most to do cost segregation and accelerated depreciation versus not? When should they decide not to do this and when should they really accelerate their depreciation? So it works best for anyone who qualifies as a real estate professional because they're able to take all the losses from the real estate wherever it comes from. If you're someone who makes or uh, your tax return shows more than $150,000 of income, we cannot deduct any losses from the rentals. So we pay taxes on the profits, but we have to suspend and hold the losses until future years. So in that case, accelerated depreciation is not our friend. That 150000 can come from um, any income, like if someone has a W-2 income? Yep, it's any income, including W-2. So right. if you're if yeah, you can deduct up to twenty five thousand dollars in losses if your income is below a hundred thousand, and then we lose one dollar of deduction for every two dollars of income over a hundred thousand. So at one hundred and fifty, oh. we've wiped out that twenty five thousand, and then we're stuck with zero. So okay. if you happen to be a husband and wife and you're both working, getting to one hundred and fifty is not all that difficult. Okay, and. So given that you're a husband, wife, and you're 150000 or greater, then this strategy doesn't work for you at that time. Right. Okay. Good to know. Um, for those of us that are less than 150000 single person, 100 and some thousand, buying real estate, is there um, an optimum amount of time or is there an optimum way to look at this to see how much accelerated depreciation you should take? So the depreciation is you know is one piece of the puzzle. I would also argue that real estate leveraged properly has a, a double digit profit. Even if you can't deduct it for, for tax purposes, it's still appreciating. So right. given time, you're gonna make 10, 20, 30% returns on your investment. That beats the stock market hands down. So, yes. so taxes are one piece of it, but also is building wealth. So I'd rather make a million. I'd actually like to pay a million dollars in taxes because that would mean I made four and I got three <laughs> left. Right. So so we shouldn't argue about how much we pay in taxes. We should be looking at the percentage that we're paying. And real estate is a great way to reduce that percentage. All right. And. This is a little off track, but I get this question all the time. Is real estate the best tax benefit device or are there other options that equal it from a tax savings perspective? So. I would say that starting a business and scaling it up is one way to establish great wealth. Certainly that's worked for Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates, right? They did OK. Right. However, that is not as easy as it sounds. Like a lot of companies started in the same time that Amazon or, or Microsoft started and they faded away to nothing. So uh, starting a business and growing it, scaling it to where you could sell it and for 5 million, 10 million, 20 million after 25 years, that's a great way to, to build a retirement plan. Uh, so that's good one. Real estate, I think, is the greatest passive one. And again, if you're lucky enough to figure out, you know, what's happening in the future and you buy NVIDIA when it was $10 and now it's $4,000 a share <laughs> after splits, you know, those that also works. But then again, you, you got to put a lot of money out there on a guess and a hope. Real estate's made more millionaires than anything else in history. I believe it's more reliable than anything else in history. Fair enough. It's a good wealth creator, that's for sure. Okay. Another question that often comes up is repairs versus improvements. There are a lot of people who this question comes up all the time. If I fixed my roof, is it a repair or a maintenance? And I would argue that if you replace the whole roof on the house, it's an improvement. If you fixed a hole in the roof, that's a repair. 
um, repairs don't necessarily prolong the use of the property, but they keep it so that you can use it. So paint, repairing window panes, fixing gutters, uh, fixing partial roofs, those are all repairs. Uh, the improvements are things that add value to the property. So if we add square footage, if we do new landscaping, if we replace the whole roof or all new appliances, those are improvements. Improvements need to be depreciated over time. Repairs are deducted all at once. Okay. Another common real estate question that comes up a lot is whether we are a dealer or an investor. And I actually, in my world, I do both. So when I do flip a house, I become a dealer through my S Corp and I, I buy it with the intent to resell it. Uh, if I make a profit, I have to pay self-employment tax if I'm a sole proprietor. I don't get to claim depreciation for the months that I own the house. And I have to pay ordinary tax when I sell it. I also do not get to take advantage of the 1031 rules to roll my gains into a new property. If I'm an investor, my intent going in is to hold it long term. And as such, I won't pay any self-employment tax. I do get to take advantage of all the depreciation that's available. I'll pay lower tax when I sell it. And I get to roll that gain into a new property if I use the 1031 rules. So, Tom, that's a great slide. Can you elaborate a little bit more on what defines a dealer from an investor from an IRS perspective so we can plan accordingly as we develop our real estate investment career? So uh, this is often misunderstood. The IRS says it's your intent going in. So if you bought a house with the intent of fixing it up, rehabbing it, and selling it, but somewhere along the line, something went wrong and you held the house for a year and a half. It is still a dealer property, even though you held it more than a year. A lot of people think if you hold the property for a year, you're automatically an investor. Right. But that, that's not your intent going in. And the IRS would look at things like, what did you put on your mortgage application? Did you get a rehab loan for a year with the intent that you were going to sell it? Or did you buy it as a rental on a rental loan? So, so what happens, Tom, when you have that person who likes the burst strategy, they want to buy the property, repair the property, refinance the property, rent the property, and repeat that strategy. So their intent, I mean, how does the IRS know your intent when you're using a flipper loan, but you decide to refinance it and keep it? Well, you'd have to tell them that that was your intent going in. So they, they have to rely a little bit on you being truthful. If okay. you were to, in an audit, they, they might ask, you know, what did you intend to do with this property going in? There's not too many clues that they have of what you what your intent was. Potentially history, though, if you flipped a couple houses over the last year, that might indicate that you're a dealer. Yeah. If you flip regularly, the IRS is going to say, yeah, you're pretty much a dealer. And so I would want to always flip in my S Corp and always hold in my LLC. OK, so. I think that makes sense, but let's clarify why you said why why the flip should be in the S corp and the hold should be in the LLC. So I don't mind being called a dealer in my S corp. It gives me the 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 ability to deduct my business expenses or take my profits and fund a four hundred one k. If I if I buy a property as a rental property and stick it in my LLC, then I get the best of depreciation, low tax rates on sale and the ability to roll over those profits. Got it. What I don't want to do is flip in the same LLC that I hold my rentals, because if they call me a dealer, then all my income is going to be subject to tax. So we always want to separate that into two different entities. Got it. Good advice. And just to complicate things further, we have what we call the real estate professional status. So. And this is often misunderstood as well. To become a real estate professional, that allows us to take our capital losses, our passive losses from our rentals and deduct them all at once because we're considered to be this, this all-encompassing business of, of real estate, as including development, acquisitions, brokerage, rental management. Unfortunately, for people like you, mortgage broker is not on this list. <laughs> 
But in order to qualify, more than half of all the services that you perform in any trade or business has to be in the real estate property trades or businesses. And it has to be at least a minimum of 750 hours a year. So certainly real estate agents, construction contractors, um, anyone that's working with development, they would all be a real estate professional and they get to take all the losses from that front loaded depreciation or operating losses on the rentals. So that, that's a great thing. And we include moving money over to the, to the S Corp with rental management fees and asset management fees. Now our, pro, our rentals show even greater losses. Okay, good. So here's a bonus strategy. A lot of people don't understand this. The non-taxable rental of your home. If you rent out your home for 14 days or less in a year, the income that you receive is non-taxable. So if you have an, an S Corp and you want to do a quarterly meeting with your staff, you could do it at your house and rent your house out to yourself for $500 or $1,000 a meeting. You could check around the area and see what would it cost to get a meeting room at a hotel. Let's say it's a thousand bucks. Then that would say that if that you could deduct a thousand dollars for holding the meeting at your house. Years ago, I had a client who owned a house across the street from the Puyallup Fairgrounds, and during the fair, he would rent out his yard to park vehicles. He would park vehicles front yard, backyard, all over the place. He made twenty grand in the weeks of the of the fair, and he did not have to pay tax on it because it was under this rule. <laughs> so. So you can rent your house out and make money tax free. As <laughs> long as that. your your compensation is reasonable. And then the last slide I have has to do with dealing with other accountants. So a lot of accountants that you talk to, they'll always say to you, you don't want to deduct that because it's a red flag. I would tell you, hey, if the IRS allows it, your documentation is good and you follow the rules, you need to take it no matter what. An audit is usually not a big deal. I represent my clients in an audit, and we're in and out in two, three, four hours. If our records are lost or we're lying on our tax return, then we need to sweat a little bit. But if we're honest and we have our documentation, we want to take everything that's allowed by law. And so when an accountant tells you that you don't want to take it because it's a red flag, they're actually telling you they don't want to work to defend it if the IRS ever comes back and questions it. I believe you, that our job is to be an advocate for paying less taxes. Absolutely. So, um, Is this your last slide, Tom? Is that correct? Then there's me. There's your smiling face and your contact <laughs> information. That's good because there's a person on the webinar who wants to know how to get a hold of Tom Howell to schedule an appointment with you. And you can see it right there. There's Tom's I cell see, phone. I see that. Email address. Yep. So they can grab that. Those of you in the YouTube audience can as well. Tom, um, great information as always. You you touched on a couple of tools, some apps that would be available. And I just want to cover that one more time here. What are the best tools, applications, software, whatever it might be to help people um, navigate through the year and keep track of the expenses and all of that. So when you do get that audit, that you are bulletproof. What would you? How would you speak to that? So certainly you could go to the extent of using something like QuickBooks, but QuickBooks is raising their prices quite dramatically. So for a small operation, I would not recommend QuickBooks. You could simply do an Excel spreadsheet or Google Sheets and just track everything by spreadsheet. You should keep track of all your receipts. I like to take pictures with my phone scanner. So I always have a picture. I scan them when I bring them back to my office. So I don't have to keep the paper. I just have scanned copies of the receipts. Um, QuickBooks is good if you have multiple properties or an active business. You can even do it on it. You can do it on a yellow pad if you have one or two rentals. You can just keep everything on a yellow pad. The IRS doesn't mandate that you have any particular type of bookkeeping, just that you have a system to be accurate. 
So if you had a yellow pad and you wrote down mileage when you started the day as you're driving to your rental and mileage at the end, that's acceptable. That that's acceptable. Cool. You could you could do it in your in your contact book. You know, if you if you use Outlook or some other scheduling software, you could put the miles in a comment field and track them every day. That would qualify. Good. Um, you mentioned that you like to take a picture and scan it. Is there a particular app that you use for that in your on your phone, Tom? Well, let me see what it's called. I use something called Scanner Pro, which is an app that I downloaded onto my iPhone. I'm I'm sure there are different scanner apps out there, but they all, you know, take a picture of your scan it, create a PDF. Nice small file, easy to store. And what do you do with the PDF, Tom, once you have it? Well, I store everything in OneNote. So I then copy it over and store it in my OneNote. All right. But you don't have to. You can dump them in any file. As long as you have access to them at the end of the year and you can pull them out. Right. All right. I, do you recommend if you have five properties, you have five different folders that are different and you put them in there and it makes it easy at the end of the year? Is that how you? That would be easy to do things at the end of the year. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, any other last thoughts here, Tom, preparing for taxes next year now that we're halfway through this year and we somewhat over the pain of the taxes we paid from last year? What's the best <laughs> thing to do to get ready for next? Well, uh, you know, part of what I talked about at the very beginning was having a plan for your taxes, knowing when you should do transactions, when you shouldn't, thinking about how to create the most deductions every year. We're going into the presidential election and there are both candidates have very different views on how the tax system should operate. And the, the tax deductions, the tax reductions that we got in 2018 are set to expire in 2026. So uh, I believe if Trump gets reelected, he's going to keep those tax cuts in place. He's talked about even cutting taxes further, but we'll see how well that goes. If Biden gets reelected, he says he's going to let the tax, the Trump tax cuts expire and raise taxes over time. So we need to keep track of who's going to win this presidency and see what they're going to do. So I don't know that this year is going to change dramatically, but 25, 26, 27 could be um, very different. Got it. All right. You know, and if, you know, if capital gains go up, so uh, I've heard Biden say he wants to raise capital gains from 20% to as high as 40%. If that happens, you'd want to sell your properties earlier and get that 20% tax hit and then reinvest rather than let your your equity ride for a 40% tax hit later. Okay. Great information, Tom. I want to thank you for sharing your time with us today in the slides and your smiling face. Everybody can see you there, so that's great. <laughs> I think we're going to have to have you back again. I, there's questions in the back of my mind that we could explore that would take us another 35 minutes, I can tell, because it's just it's a deep uh, topic here we're talking about. So thanks a lot for your time today, Tom. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. All right. Thanks, guys, for joining us on the webinar.